As, as Pastor Mike was saying, in February of 2006, when I called 400 pastors to San Antonio to establish Christians United for Israel, <clears throat> Pastor Mac came and CUFI was born. And the supernatural element of that moment was that in front of me were 400 of the strongest evangelical leaders in America. The presidents of Bible colleges, the owners of radio television stations, and the pastors of America's strongest churches. Now those are leaders, and leaders are hard to lead. They just don't vote for something spontaneously. They want to debate, debate it ad infinitum. And after I'd made that presentation, I said, how many of you would be willing to be a part of this? Like, like they were all hung to the same string, 400 hands went up in the air without one word of debate. I'm gonna tell you when the Lord's church gets united, supernatural things happen. I asked Lynn if she would start a women's prayer group across the nation they now have how many groups, Lynn? 30,000 30, prayer groups in the United States of America that she has founded called Daughters for Zion. If you're not in one of those groups, I urge you, those of you here and those of you who are watching, because prayer has the access to heaven and heaven controls what happens on the earth. Thank you, Lynn, for all that you're doing. Today, because of godly and righteous people like Pastor Mac and Lynn, this Christians United for Israel organization is recognized in Washington and in Israel as the largest pro-Israel organization in the world. We are that organization. Our subject today is Israel, God's prophetic clock. God has a set time to do everything, and Israel is God's prophetic clock for doing it. Recognize this fact, that God's clock only moves when the Jewish people are in the land of Israel. And when they are in the land, the clock starts ticking. You'll see that today in God's word. Read with me Psalms, 100 and, uh, Psalms 12, 102, verse 13. Ready? You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in the Lord's house this morning. Thank you for every precious soul of God that has come today to hear the word of God that directs us in paths of righteousness, that your name may be glorified and that your word may be presented to the nations of the world. We say thank you and amen. amen. Can you be seated please? As a child of God walking in faith, every day that you live is a day that can produce a miracle. Several weeks ago, Donna and I <clears throat> were walking together and she is doing something a lot of women do. She was looking at her cell phone as she was walking. Uh, I know that if I get to heaven and hear a cell phone ring, uh, I've come to the wrong place. <laughs> and she turned and said to me, you won't believe this. I said, what, what is that? She said, we're invited to the White House to have, president, to have dinner with the president. I said, no, I don't believe that. Let me see it. <laughs> so I read it. And um, so we had met him a few days before. We went to Washington and met with the vice president to ask him to be the speaker at CUFI, to which he agreed. And as we uh, were sitting in the, uh, we're on TV, right? <clears throat> I probably shouldn't tell them. As we... <laughs> As we were sitting there, he came late. I am going to tell it. Uh, and he said, I apologize for being late, but we had some work and we were staying over late to do it. 
I said, well, Mr. Vice President, I congratulate you. And as much as the past eight years, nothing's been done up here, I'm sure you're behind. <laughs> and he said, uh, the boss is here, and I thought he was talking about his wife, and he said, uh, he wants to meet you. I said, the boss would be, he said, the president. He's in the Oval Office. So we walked out uh, with the vice president down a, uh, a long hall to the Oval Office, and there the president was behind that desk you see on television, and he was signing a large stack of those leather documents with that humongous signature he has. And um, we walked in, and he uh, gave us a very warm greeting, and he got up and uh, shook our hand, and we started chatting about uh, various things. And uh, he said, um, he, he took, them, took all of those and just set them aside. He said, let's have some, some fun. And the reason Dinah was out here trying to take a picture with her cell phone and her hands were shaking. <laughs> and uh, the vice president went over and took the cell phone out of her hand and said, let me take the picture. And she came to stand beside me and the president said, actually, why don't we have the professional photographer who walked in the room to shoot these shots? So the vice president came over and joined us. We had a wonderful 15 or 20 minutes of conversation with the president. I want to tell you that the president of the United States is warm, he's gracious, he loves America, he loves Israel, he is tuned in to what's going on, but if you attack him, he's gonna say something ugly about you. Uh, so within minutes, um, we, we left and uh, a few weeks later, we received an invitation to come to the White House. We flew to Washington, D.C. This is the second trip. Flew to Washington, D.C. and went through several uh, security checks to get into the uh, White House dining room. And we, Don and I sat down and <clears throat> we're waiting for what is a, purported to be the most powerful man in the world. He has a wife, so that's not true. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, so he came in the room, he clapped his hands, he gave a huge smile, and he warmly greeted us, and we sat down, we started talking. And then within just uh, a handful of minutes, he asked the question, Pastor, do you think if I declare that uh, Jerusalem is going to be the capital of Israel, that it will cause a war in the Middle East. I said, absolutely not. I said, as a matter of fact, I think it will bring peace to the Middle East. He said, why do you think that? I said, because every time you propose for the Palestinians and the Israelis to get together to have peace, the Palestinians won't come because they say, when you give us Jerusalem as our capital, then we'll come. I said, if you take Jerusalem off the table and it's no longer a debatable issue, now they have to perform instead of just talk about something that's never going to be. He said, I like that idea. I said, thank you. And he said, um, uh, I said, uh, let me share a verse with you from the Bible. I had uh, a new prophecy Bible and I was going to give it to him and I did give it to him. And uh, I read... Leviticus 25, 10, and 11. You're familiar with that verse. Basically, it says that God divides time in modules of 50 years. And that's true. It's called a jubilee year. And that in this jubilee year, all debts are forgiven. You want to know what would resolve the economic crisis in America? For us to have jubilee year just one time. Uh, but that's another subject for another day. And then I said, in this jubilee year, all indentured servants are returned. It's a year when good things happen. I said, let's go back to show you how the clock works. I said, it only works when the Jewish people come to the land. So 1917 in the Balfour Declaration would be the year of jubilee because it was the year that the British gave a homeland to the Jewish people, and they came to Israel from the north, the south, the east, and the west. It was at a set time, 1917. 
So 50 with 1917, 50 added to 1917 is 1967. That was the Six Day War when Israel defeated five Arab armies that had been armed, trained, and equipped by the Russians. They defeated them in six days by doing something the Israelis had never done. They made a preemptive Air Force attack on the uh, Egyptian Air Force and knocked it out before they re recognized that Israel was in the fight. They doubled the size of Israel and made Jerusalem a part of the state of Israel once again, a huge Bible and prophecy event. 1967, 1967 plus 50, Mr. President, is the year 2017. That's where we are right now. This is a critical, historical, prophetic, significant year in the mind of God. And this year, you are the President of the United States. You are standing on the threshold of political immortality. Exactly like Harry Truman, when he recognized the state of Israel in 11 minutes after Ben-Gurion read the declaration in 1948. I said, 100 years from now, people are not going to be talking about the fake news. I said, they're, they're not going to be talking about the Russians hacking or not hacking your computers. They're going to remember that you did declare that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Mr. President, this is the set time. This is a jubilee year. You are the person that God has put in this place. And I said, I believe you are here because as a candidate, you made the quickest, most clear, bold declarations of the state of Israel of any of those 16 candidates running for the presidency of the United States. He didn't respond, but I could tell that the Jubilee year concept, he quickly got a hold of that. We talked about other things that we can't talk about publicly. And we got through, we were there for two hours. And he stood up and pointed his finger directly at me and he said this, other presidents have promised you and failed you about Jerusalem, but I will not fail you. <laughs> A few days later, December the 6th, the president declared Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. Now and forever, he made a promise and he kept the promise. I assure you, we have a president who keeps his word contrary to the fake news that you're hearing in this nation. The Bible says, I will bless those who bless you. Say that with me. I will bless those who bless you. I can tell you the blessing of God is on this ministry and is on this pastor and his wife because of their bold stand with the state of Israel. Look at the blessings that have been poured out on America in, this, in, in the first year of the presidency here. Our military is being rebuilt. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. My town has five military bases. I know the condition the U.S. military was in at the end of Barack Obama's administration. It was horrible. It was horrible. The Air Force was cannibalizing two or three planes to make a fourth plane work. We were in worse shape than we were at Pearl Harbor. Now our military is being re rebuilt. Uh, our military is crushing ISIS, by the way. Our borders are becoming secure. Yes. Our, our, our infrastructure is being rebuilt. We have a president who treats Israel like an ally and not like an enemy. We have progress in America like we haven't had in 30 years. Give the Lord praise in the house. So let's talk now about Israel. Israel is not a political issue, it's a Bible issue. It's not possible to say, I believe the Bible and not support Israel and the Jewish people. 
The fact is, Israel is the only nation in the history of the world that was created by a sovereign act of God. And that starts in Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, was, in the, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. As owner of the earth, he was owner because he didn't come here and rearrange something. He created something out of nothing. He spoke it into existence. As owner of the earth, he entered into an eternal blood covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob after Adam and Eve failed, after the flood failed. He came to a man named Abraham because he knew he would trust him. And he made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the land of Israel forever. The Bible says the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, that would be the Jewish people, I will give this land, Genesis 12 and 7. Again, in Genesis 15, 18, God makes covenant with Abraham to give his descendants the land of Israel forever. Genesis 17, 7 and 8, God speaking to Abraham, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in this generation for an everlasting covenant. You get the word, God wants them to have this land forever. And it's his to give. And I shall, I shall also give your, your descendants after you all of the land of Canaan. And if you read the Bible borders of that land grant, it's many multiples the size of Israel right now. It's a huge land grant. Israel must never be separated from its biblical roots. The, the, the covenant for Abraham and his descendants to own the land of Israel forever is in the Bible 22 times. So if you are slow to catch on, surely by the time you get to the end, you've got that point. The God we serve does not break covenant. And he made a covenant with the Jewish people for that land. The Bible says, I am the Lord and I keep covenant for a thousand generations. Technically, a generation, according to Genesis 15, 16, is a hundred years. So that would be a hundred thousand years, but it actually translates longer than forever. Either way, that contract has a long time to run, and that contract is between God and the Jewish people. The media and historical revisionists are trying to separate Israel from their Bible roots, and that must never be allowed to happen. The more secular we become, the more anti-Semitic America becomes. The more we get away from the Word of God, the more everything else God wants becomes secondary and pushed aside. When media types like Helen Thomas say, the Jews do not occupy, the, the Jewish people should go back to Europe. The Jews should not occupy the land of Israel. They should move to a European country. Please be informed that the Jewish people do not occupy the land of Israel. They own the land of Israel. <laughs> It's the only place they can live according to God's word. God owns the earth. It's his call, not Washington's, not the European Union, not the United Nations. And thank God for Ms. Haley, who's doing a fabulous job in the, in the United Nations. It's not Iran's call. It's not the Palestinians' call. The Jewish people are the sole heirs of the land of Israel, according to Genesis 17. The most controversial geopolitical question of our generation is about this little piece of land. God removed Ishmael. When God and Abraham were negotiating the contract, Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael, the father of the Arabs, can be a part of this. And God answers in one word, no. What part of no don't you get? Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. That's what Abraham asked. And God said no. The message is Ishmael and the Arabs are out concerning the land grant. The Palestinians are Arabs. Listen to me very closely. I could do an hour teaching on this historically, but don't have the time. Listen. There has never been 
an autonomous group of people in the history of the world called the Palestinians. Never. It's a made up word and it was made up by Yasser Arafat after the 1948 war and it has become a media fact of history that never does exist. That's a fact. You won't hear that on ABC, NBC, or CBS, but that is a truth of history. Ishmael was blessed. God made him, the Bible says in the next chapter, a mighty nation of 12 princes with great wealth. Please hear this. God loves the Arab people. He made them very wealthy by design. So you have a complicated theological something that can be reduced to one simple sentence. You have one father, you have two sons. The father loves both boys. One is the father of the Jews, one is the father of the Arabs. God says, I'm going to give the land to Isaac. And I'm going to give the gas and oil called OPEC to Ishmael. So when you go to Israel, you're blessing Isaac. And when you're going to the gas pump today to pump your tank full of gas for $3 a gallon, you're blessing Ishmael. That's as simple as you can make it. Isaac got the land, Ishmael got the gas and the oil. And the Bible records that they would be a mighty and a wealthy nation. And so have they been. The Bible records God's promise of national and personal blessing and curse based on the individual people and nations that treat Israel. I will bless those who bless you, the back half of that, and I will curse those who curse you. Look at history. Egypt drowned Jewish male children in the Nile River. God drowned Pharaoh and the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. God killed the Egyptians just like they had done the Jewish children. Obadiah 1.15 says, For the day of the Lord upon all nations is near. As you have done it unto Israel, so shall it be done to you. You need to know that the day of the Lord in the Bible is the day of extreme judgment, which theologians consider to be the great tribulation. This historical evidence, Haman of Persia, which is modern day Iran, built a gallus to hang the Jews. But as the drama plays out, he and his sons were hung on the very gallus that he built to destroy the Jews. God is going to crush Iran in the near future. I'll tell you how before the service is over. Sennacherib, 2 Kings 18, the king of Assyria, a godless pagan, invaded Israel promising to exterminate the Jewish people and to demolish the city of Jerusalem. He wrote a nasty letter to Hezekiah telling him to surrender or be slaughtered. Hezekiah spread that letter before the Lord and said, look what this pagan has written to you. And the Bible says, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Keepeth is a military term, which means to defend. That night, the death angel swept across the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in their tents. The next morning when Hezekiah looked over the wall and saw 185,000 dead people, he said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us bless his name forever. For the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. Give the Lord praise in the house of God. <laughs> so the question, why should Americans care about this? Because America in the Barack Obama administration gave $150 billion to Iran whose mantra is death to Israel, death to America, wipe Israel off the map, and Israel is a one-bomb nation. When we as a nation put that man in office and he made that decision, we fall under the tail end of I will curse those who curse you. When Iran uses that $150 billion to build nuclear rockets 
and those nuclear rockets are going to be shot into Israel to kill the Jewish people. God's judgment will come to this country and you can go to the bank with that. That's going to happen. War is going to come at a set time. Listen closely. Russia and Iran are joined at the hip according to Ezekiel 38 and they are united in their attack toward Israel. You're watching this right now on the evening news and the headlines of your newspaper. Russia's not going to Israel for oil. Fracking has produced so much oil, there's a global glut of oil. I was speaking to a military officer from uh, Israel in my office the other day, intelligence officer. And he, I said, why are the Russians wanting to come to Israel? He said, Israel has the only real estate in the world where there's a warm water access to the oceans of the world. And so we walked over to the globe and he said, right here is where Russia has their navy. And he said, it is freezing there most of the time. But four months out of the year, their navy is frozen in ice. You should get that. I mean, you should understand that in a moment. I saw a lake of ice this morning for the first time in my life. <laughs> the biggest thing that I've seen that was frozen like that was a nice cube in a glass of tea. That was three feet deep and there's somebody driving across it. <laughs> I won't ever, we'll never forget that. So he said Israel must have a war, um, Russia must have a warm water port in order to control the Middle East and to control the world. And he looked at me and said, don't you ever forget it. Russia is rebuilding the former USSR and Iran is rebuilding the Persian Empire and they're joined at the hip together and their ultimate purpose is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth and they want that piece of property. He said the value of Israel is that warm water port. He's the only reason to have a military base. In Syria is that the Russians, let me say it this way, you need to know that while I'm talking right now, Russia is building a military airport 18 miles from Israel's northern border, 18 miles. How long does it take for a fighter jet to go 18 miles once it gets up in the air and it's in Israel's airspace? The only reason they have that military base is to deal with Israel's air force in the coming war that's not many days down the road. They are not building that air force for any of that airport for any other reason than a military engagement that is soon to start. In my opinion, the first shots preparing the Gog Magog war were fired nine days ago on February the 9th when Iran launched a drone from Syria into Israel. I received a phone call immediately from Israel saying, we want you to get this message out because the print media in America does not want to carry the fact that Iran shot this drone over our land. And we did that. I called Pastor Matt. I called all of the people in, uh, sent by email, four million people, and the phones across America started ringing and the message was sent out, a message of truth that came from the headquarters of Christians United for Israel directly from the state of Israel. But Israel responded, especially when that aircraft was shot down. Why? Israel has not lost an aircraft in 36 years. And the shooting of that aircraft meant the Russians were involved because the Arabs have never shot anything down the Israelis have ever put in the air. Israel sent 12 jets and those 12 jets knocked out four Syrian command posts and eight Iranian command posts. Those 12 
military positions represented one half of what Russia has been trying to do in Syria since they've been there. The only reason to have that military base is because they anticipate a coming war. Now look at a map. Iran, with Russia's help, is rapidly rebuilding the Persian Empire. Iran, it trains, equips, and funds the terrorist armies of Hamas and Hezbollah, whose purpose is to kill and destroy the Jews. The same officer that was telling me about the warm water necessity was saying that the state, that, uh, that Hezbollah is trying to develop a base of operation in America. I said, for what purpose? He said, to attack you. The terrorists who have, pit, who have pledged to destroy America are not coming, they're here. Follow the money. That's what he told me. Follow the money. Have you heard that before? That generally means follow your wife, but just follow the money. <laughs> Obama gave $150 billion. And then loads of cash in multiple denominations. Why? Because that's what he gave to terrorists, Hamas and Hezbollah, to kill Jews in Israel. And then found Hezbollah, who are in America, to seek a base of operation to do what? Kill us. You follow that circle? We gave the Iranians money. They gave it to the terrorists. The terrorists are giving to the terrorists here. And now we're facing our own funds. I was told when I was in Washington that Iran was four weeks away from being bankrupt before they got that $150, $150 billion. And now they're off and running and terrorism is, is in full flight. He also said that Hezbollah has 90,000 fighters trained by Iran the equal of any in the world. Israel's next war may be instant, full force, and brutal, or Israel is not going to survive. They don't have the luxury of waiting this next time around. One house in every five in Gaza has a rocket launched toward Israel. When Israel starts bombing houses to knock those out, you can believe Israel is going to lose the propaganda war. And it's, that's the time that Christians are going to have to stand with Israel, recognizing that Israel is fighting for its survival and is knocking those out because they have to do that or they themselves will die. That's the time we stand with Israel. We fight the fake news with the truth. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. May the Lord, may it happen all over the United States of America as we get there. <laughs> Prophetically, God has a set time for the Gog Magog Wars. God set time confirmed by four blood moons. Ezekiel, uh, Joel writes in the second chapter that he will, he will send the four blood moons and the sun will refuse to give its light. There have appeared four blood moons in history. Now let me tell you, not, not these right here. For a blood moon is created when the sun shines through the earth's atmosphere and causes the moon to be red. Only God can get that alignment because God controls the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's in the Bible. The three kings followed the star to Jesus' manger. The heavens are God's billboard whether you see it or not. That's his big screen TV. And so in 1492, God caused a, a huge blood moon. That was the year the Jewish people were kicked out of Spain, the Spanish Inquisition, because they would not convert to Catholicism. The Jewish people also gave money and maps to Christopher Columbus, who discovered America. So while it was a time of suffering, it was a time when an answer was found because America became the home of the Jewish people until 1948. And then in 1948, Israel was reborn. That was the second blood moon. 
And then in 1967, Jerusalem was united. That was the third blood moon. Now comes the four blood moons of 2014, 15. Please put that diagram back up there. This is what I wrote a book about, just about these four blood moons. Let me tell you why this drove atheists just absolutely crazy. One, only God can cause a blood moon. Two, God established the date of Passover in the Bible thousands of years ago. NASA, not a group of charismatic preachers, NASA said these blood moons are going to happen on these dates years before they happened. April 15th, 14th, 10, 8, 14, and then was the sun, sun and refused to give its light, the solar eclipse. The third at Passover, and the fourth at Sukkot 9, 28, 15. Now focus on the last one. Because when I wrote the book, I said something will happen near the last blood moon that will change the course of history. We must watch for it. Joel said in 2.30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. That is the genesis of the Gog Magog Wars. This is declared by Jewish theologians who are very knowledgeable about that book. This scribes war on war beginning the Gog Magog Wars that will lead to the Battle of Armageddon. The sun shall be darkened, that's the eclipse, and the moon shall be turned to blood before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. These four blood moons were God's big screen presentation so what happened 13 days before the last blood moon? 13 days before the last blood moon was 92815. That's the last one, 13 days before that. Russia moved its military forces into the Middle East preparing for the Gog Magog Wars since, the, this, since this will be a time of great tribulation. The prophet Ezekiel perfectly predicted this in Ezekiel 38, 15, saying that Russia would come out of the far north and set their sights on Israel. That one prophecy was what we were waiting for. 13 days prior, Vladimir Putin brought his military troops out of the far north, just like Ezekiel said 3,000 years ago, and set their camp in the Middle East, their eyes on Israel. Verse 16, Ezekiel 38 says, you, Russia, will come from your part out of the far north. You and many people with you, who's coming with them? Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, the Islamic Arab nations, and Libya. It will be an army of millions. You're going to come up against my people like a cloud. It will be in the latter days, which means right now, that you shall come against my land, that I will be hallowed in you before the eyes of the Jewish people. What does that mean? It means that in Israel right now, most people have just given up that God loves them, that God is their defender because of the Holocaust. God is going to do something so supernatural it simply defies what men can think of. It is in Ezekiel 38, very plainly. In your mind, visualize an army of millions moving toward Israel. Why is God doing this? Because he is putting the hook in the jaw of these nations. He's dragging them down there. Why? Because God promised to be a defender of Israel and this is the day of God's wrath against every nation that ever tormented the Jewish people throughout history. If you track those people who are coming, Russia and their abuse of the Jewish people, Iran, which is Persia, which has the first Holocaust, God does not forget an offense unless you ask his forgiveness. And those people are still trying to harass the Jewish people. And God is saying to those nations, come on down here. Come on down here. Put your foot on this covenant soil and give me a reason 
to clean your clock. That's a Texas translation of Ezekiel 38. So what's going to happen? For his first marvelous performance, God is going to send an earthquake so vast that the mountains of Israel are going to be leveled. It's going to be huge. He's going to simultaneously, instantaneously bury about a third of that army. Whew. Gone. Now the earth is filled with dust and dirt. You have nine armies on a very small piece of property speaking nine different languages. The Bible says there will then every man's sword will be turned against each other. That's what we call in military terms friendly fire. They're going to start firing at each other in the confusion. And they're going to kill a significant group of each other. And then for God's final performance, he is going to send stones from heaven. Why? Because that's his signature. In the Old Testament, under the law, when you sinned, they stoned you that day. God in, in Judges 10, whenever Israel was in the war with the five kings, that's when Joshua asked for the sun to stand still. I need more time to, to, to defeat these five kings. God gave him the time. But the last verse in that story says, and the stones that came from heaven killed more of the enemy than the swords of Israel. God stoned the enemies of Israel. He's going to do it one more time. And he's going to do it on such a grand scale that Ezekiel 39.2, King James Version, everybody else waffles on that, says, I'm going to leave but a sixth part of you. That means five out of six are going to be killed. That's 84%. Why is he leaving 16%? So messengers can go back to Russia, can go back to Iran, can go back to the country that sent them and said, we went down there in the name of our God to kill the Jews, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a defender of the Jewish people so because of the rapture of the church happens before, why, why should you be concerned about this? Because the rapture of the church happens before the Gog-Magog wars. Get that thought in your mind. The Gog-Magog wars are getting ready to take place right in front of your eyes. I say Christians' theology teaches it's one war. It's at least two, maybe three. And that first war is not far down the road. That means the trump of God could sound before we get out of this building. That's how close we are to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, when you see these things, lift up your heads and rejoice. Your redemption draweth nigh. Give him praise in the house of God. Stand and give the Lord praise in the house. Glory, glory to the Lamb of God. We thank you, God, for your goodness. Amen. Pastor Matt.